Okay, I'm going to go ahead and begin. Um, I think there are probably a few other people coming on, but I, I do want to get going. There's, again, a lot of information. Um, I like doing this um, webinar every year to sort of review what's going on out in the research world and what's going on in terms of new treatments and um, what's available and what we're doing here at Meditress as well. Um, for those of you who have... Um, joined us before. Thank you again for coming. And are anybody new? Uh, welcome. Um, I'm, as the picture says, this, I'm Dr. Mary Wendell. I'm the um, founder of Meditrust. We've been open here about seven years now. Um, so let me get started. What's new in the treatment of female hair loss for 2023? Okay, sorry. Um, again, welcome. We're going to cover a lot of different things tonight. Um, this list is just touching on the, on the major topics, uh, but we will be going through a great deal. Um, I kind of just want to do a quick review on just some vocabulary because there's some words you're going to hear, and many of you have heard them before. And I just want you to want to make sure that you're you're understanding what it is I'm actually talking about. But just briefly, um, this is the hair life cycle. There's three stages. The antigen is the growth cycle. The catagen is when it start, the hair starts to pull away from the root. And then the telogen is when it falls out. And then it, it's followed by a, a resting phase um, that can last anywhere from a few weeks to uh, a few months. And that's going to play a big role in some of the disease entities that we're going to talk about um, is that resting phase and, and how to shorten it and or avoid it altogether. Again, the risks for female hair loss are, are multiple. The causes are multiple. Genetics does play a big role in a lot of these diseases. Um, stress uh, is just immeasurable and huge now. And in fact, I think is playing a big role in some of the increases in, in hair loss that we're seeing in the last year and a half to two years. Poor nutrition plays a huge role. I did a lot of research on nutrition when we were doing our study, which I'll talk about later. Um, our nutritional uh, value of our foods is poor. Even if you think you're eating a good diet, I follow a pretty whole food, uh, natural, unprocessed diet. But unfortunately, the nutritional components of our food are significantly decreased compared to 50 years ago. And a lot of that has to do with soil quality and overuse of our soil. Um, illness plays a huge part in, in hair loss. Uh, hormonal imbalances for women can't be stressed enough. Unfortunately, age plays a role. And um, the older we are, the more likely we are to experience hair loss. And then scalp and follicle health, uh, overall skin health uh, can play a role as well. Again, just quickly talking about two types of hair loss, again, because it's going to come up and I want you to understand what I'm talking about. The non-scarring alopecia means the scalp is relatively healthy. Um, the hair follicle is not being damaged irreparably. The hair loss is usually kind of diffuse. It can be a little patchy as well, but usually these types of hair losses can be uh, treated and regrowth is possible. Androgenic alopecia is the most common. Telogen fluium is the shedding. Traction alopecia occurs as a result of pulling too hard on the hair. Alopecia areata um, is um, most commonly round circular spots of hair loss, but it can progress to complete hair loss. Post-cancer uh, hair loss, post-cancer treatment hair loss is also non-scarring. Scarring alopecias are a little tough to treat. They're inflammatory and autoimmune. The hair follicles uh, get destroyed and treatment needs to be aggressive and, and early. Um, these are the three most common causes, the, the frontal fibrosing alopecia, central centrifugal cicatricial alopecia, and lichen planopolaris. Okay, this can't be stressed enough. Um, there's a lot of uh, med spas out there that are treating hair loss, but unless you've had a good medical evaluation, um, you might not be getting the treatment that you need. Um, medical history is important, the hair loss history, family history, complete examination, trichoscopy, which is the microscopic evaluation of the scalp, Blood work oftentimes is ordered, and sometimes we'll do a biopsy, but not always. Um, it's The treatment plan is very different depending on the cause, and without knowing what the cause is, you might be getting the wrong kind of treatment. So let's talk a little bit about COVID, um, although we're all kind of tired about talking about it, but we're dealing with it here in the office. Studies have shown that greater than 50% of COVID patients have TE, which is a telogen effluvium, which is the excessive shedding. Um, very common. 
Um, we see, we're seeing a lot of it here in the office. It tends to occur a little earlier than normal telogen effluviums do, but like most telogen effluvium, it will resolve. Um, it seems to be the severity of it depends on the severity of the uh, disease. So patients that were hospitalized due to severe COVID, the, the likelihood of developing um, shedding or telogen effluvium is greater than 80%. It again, occurs about two months after the infection um, and lasts anywhere from one to six months. Um, the other thing that we're seeing um, as a result of COVID is the increase of scarring alopecia during the last two years. Um, there's only now being research done as to whether this is related to COVID uh, or the vaccine. Um, the other issue is how much is stress playing a role in any of this? And the answer to that is it's playing a huge role. Uh, people who have had alopecia areata um, in the past and have been in remission, we have found that after COVID, their disease recurs, unfortunately. Well, what about the vaccine? I almost hate to even bring this up, but it's something that we've been seeing here in the office. Um, patients are experiencing some shedding after the vaccine. Studies have reported uh, worsening or exacerbations of the alopecia areata after vaccination. Um, it has been reported in a few instances of patients who never had it before, which is um, disturbing. Um, there is a, uh, a, dermato a plastic surgeon actually in, in Florida, Dr. Karanakula Epstein, who's done a lot of research on uh, the effects of COVID and the vaccine on hair loss. And she um, has been observing increasing rates of scarring alopecia after um, the vaccine. Um, the vaccine does induce a very strong immune reaction, and other autoimmune diseases have been noted afterwards, including thyroid and rheumatic diseases and a few others. Um, she actually recommends a um, very high dose of, of vitamins and nutrients to offset the shedding that occurs after, after COVID. She's a strong believer in functional medicine and the benefits of, of uh, nutrition, and her research supports that. So what actually happens with the COVID-19 infection? There's something called a cytokine storm, which is the cells release proteins and substances which uh, can then cause damage in other parts of the body. And it can uh, affect the hair follicle as well. It also causes a pro-inflammatory response. We believe that's where the telogen effluvium comes from, which is the shedding. Antigen effluvium is also shedding. It's a it's a bit more aggressive and occurs more suddenly, but it has been reported as well. And then there's the flare-up of the autoimmune diseases with the scarring alopecia and the alopecia areata. The vaccine does induce a strong immune response. But I will tell you, all of the research that has been done, reported on the effects of, the, of COVID and the vaccine all report that it is a temporary worsening of the hair loss and with proper treatment, um, there is recovery. And that's the good news. So I'm not here to tell you to avoid getting your vaccine. I'm a proponent of the vaccine, but it is a potential side effect in patients who are sensitive to autoimmune disorders. Okay, let's talk about new treatments. Um, we got a question from somebody who uh, wanted to have Botox treatment for their androgenic alopecia. And although I had read a few studies on it, I, I didn't know a lot about it. So to answer her question as to whether we would do it on her, I did a bit more research. And there were um, there was a review study done um, just this past spring, uh, which reviewed the very few studies that had been reported on Botox with, with androgenic alopecia. The results um, of this review study did show that 75% of patients had some degree of improvement with improved hair counts of 18 to 20%, which sounds um, impressive. However, uh, and that's a big however, um, these studies were all done on men. Not, not one of them was reported on women. There were a very small number of participants. There were no controlled studies done, meaning comparing treatment versus no treatment. These studies were all done outside of the United States. There was no comparison of Botox to treatments that are already known to be beneficial. Um, the frequency of treatment is unknown. They basically just did one treatment and, and determined if there was benefit. Um, the, the actual doses of the Botox that was used ex varied extremely from anywhere from 30 units to 100 or plus uh, units of Botox used to treat. The areas of the scalp that were treated were different with all these studies. 
Um, the duration of the benefit was unknown. How long is it going to last? And when the review of the studies were done, these were actually felt to be low quality studies based on um, characteristics that are used in the United States. So although it seemed to have some benefit, I don't believe it has any more benefit than what we do. In fact, what we do, we know does work. We know how often it needs to be treated and we know um, potential side effects, long-term, short-term. So the bottom line is um, more studies need to be done on Botox. And I'm not saying that it doesn't help. The problem is we don't know um, how long it's going to work and is it worth the cost and the discomfort that comes along with it. The other side of it is none of these studies were done on women, which is fairly typical. Um, a lot of studies on a lot of different medical problems are done on men first and then women second, which is problematic. Um, I just want to uh, technically just tell people, if you have a question, the Q&A section is where to put it. Don't put anything in the chat section. Um, that's a whole different issue. So if you have a question, the Q&A section, and that's what we will be answering at the end of the webinar. Okay, PDO threads. We talked about this a little bit um, once before in a different webinar. PDO stands for polydioxinone threads. These are used actually in plastic surgical practices. Um, they are absorbable FDA approved sutures. They're tiny that have been used for many, many years for facial rejuvenation. Um, it looks a little invasive. It actually is a lot less invasive than it looks. These um, in the face, these threads are injected and they stimulate collagen and elastin production. You get skin tightening and lifting. The sutures dissolve on their own. Um, over a very short period of time. So what does this have to do with hair? Well, um, like PRP, the inflammatory reaction that occurs with the PDO threads does stimulate new cell growth. And it specifically does uh, improve hair regrowth when injected into the scalp area. There aren't a lot of good, there are not a lot of good studies available. Most of the information is anecdotal, meaning doctors sharing their experiences. Um, it certainly started with plastics, um, and facial rejuvenation, and, and like many things, has transitioned into other areas uh, for rejuvenation. There was one randomized control trial, which was reported about a year ago, which did show that um, there was significant improvement in hair thickness, a decreased rate of hair loss as compared to the non-treatment group. Um, I will say that um, the, these particular, this particular study, they didn't utilize PRP with the PDO threads. Um, I will show you some of our results. We also do P, a PR treatment, excuse me, a PRP treatment when we do the PDO thread treatment as well. So the improvements with the PDO threads uh, seems to start within a few months. The results generally last up to year, a year. The benefit of the PDO threads is it only requires one treatment to get the benefits versus three to four treatments of the PRP that we normally do. So we do a, we we have done some PDO threads. Generally, we um, do them on patients that have not responded well to standard treatments, and we do find that in some cases they do get benefit where they hadn't gotten any before. And again, we do PRP treatments along with the PDO thread. So these are before and after on a couple of patients that we've done. And again, these were women who didn't get as good a response as we had hoped from their previous treatments, and were willing to try something new, and it did seem to help them. Another new treatment that's gotten a lot of press is something called exosomes. Um, I will tell you that it's not really available right now, although it has been used in some parts of the country. Exosomes are actually tiny little vesicles or sacs of fluid that contain proteins and a lot of information from the RNA, the DNA. And these particular sacs or vesicles are excreted from, this, from one cell. They're like packed with information and they function as communicators between cells. It's kind of fascinating that people would look towards these things. But what has been found is that these exosomes from stem cells that can be found in bone marrow, fat tissue, placental cells, umbilical cells, they have hundreds of growth factors, which we know stimulate new growth. Um, when injected into the scalp, they do stimulate new hair growth. However, um, there are no published studies done at this time. And there are no standardized protocols. Um, exosomes are presently not FDA approved for human use in the U.S. There are um, a few uh, practices that are that are using them. You, they are being used under experimental protocols that are FDA approved for that for the study only. Um, 
And clinical trials do demonstrate short-term safety of these exosomes to be used in regenerative medicine, but data showing efficacy and safety of the exosome therapy for alopecia are lacking. So again, no published studies yet, no standardized protocols, no comparison of this treatment versus what we're already doing. Um, they're certainly uh, a, a big part of the regenerative medicine world. Um, there's a lot of um, research being done um, to see if, in fact, in the future, they may have some usefulness in uh, cell regeneration. Uh, further studies clearly need to be, uh, be done. All right, we wanted to update PRP a little bit because... Um, you know, we're pretty comfortable doing PRP here. We do a lot of it. Um, we do um, uh, we do a slightly different version of it called OPC, which is optimal platelet count PRP. Um, but there's a lot of different protocols and results out there in the in the regenerative world. And we we this gentleman, uh, Dr. Gupta, um, who's at this conference that I went to um, a couple of weeks ago. What he did is he looked at all the studies that are out there and compared them. So we could come up with some idea of what's the best schedule, you know, what works best for men versus women? What about the age of the patients? Do we need to change how we do it depending on the patient? So he reviewed hundreds of studies and did what's called a meta-analysis, which just means reviewing everything, taking a look at it and making some comparisons. What he found was that the benefit, the efficacy of the PRP increases when the number of sessions increases. And now his studies that he reviewed compared anywhere from one to four treatments. We presently are doing three, sometimes four, depending on the situation. The interesting thing that, that surprised me a little bit was that the time interval between the sessions, when they decreased a little bit, there was a little bit benefit uh, to, to decreasing that. And um, we will be looking at that as well, a little bit more closely. Now, the PRP solution can be activated chemically. We do that here. Um, not all offices do, but we do. And what this, this study showed was that chemically activating it is more effective than when they don't activate it. It just stimulates the um, growth factors to start doing their job. The double spin, again, that's a technical issue with the centrifuge. Patients come in and they know a lot about this. And they say, they literally ask, do you do a double spin? <laughs> because they know it works better. And yes, we do. And this study did show that double spin works better than a single. Uh, not surprising, PRP was found to be more effective in younger patients, um, like all treatments, particularly for, well, really for any kind of hair loss. The earlier you start treatment, the greater, greater likelihood you're going to have success. And it's heartbreaking when we see people come in um, late in the game. Um, you know, they've been dealing with hair loss for, you know, 10, 15, 20 years, and they've um, just started looking into treatment. And the sooner people get in for treatment, the better. Um, the other thing that was found is that PRP monotherapy, in other words, just doing PRP alone for hair loss is more effective in women than in men. A caveat to that, though, is um, we don't recommend monotherapy because we know, based on our experience and based on research that other people have done, that combination therapy is additive. So we've had patients come in and say, I'm not doing anything other than the PRP. We try to talk them out of that because we know they'll get even more benefit if they add to that. But patients who've had monotherapy, just done PRP or, or our OPC treatment, they do get benefit. They do. They absolutely do. And it's interesting that that works better for women than it does for men. Again, don't know why. So this was an interesting study in that it confirmed a lot of things that we were already doing and we were pleased about. Um, the frequency of treatment, we're going to take a look at that. Um, but for now, we still do one treatment uh, once a month for three to four treatments. Okay, oral medications. We've talked about some of these before, but I want to update a little bit. Oral minoxidil, hot topic. It was in the New York Times. Everybody jumped on it. I will tell you, it's nothing new. Minoxidil has been around for a very long time. When I was in general medical practice, we used it to treat hypertension. It was found accidentally 30, 40 years ago to help hair grow. I will tell you the men patients that were on minoxidil in my, in my practice had great hair. It was a joke, but it was true. Now, now we're talking about low dose oral minoxidil. A lot of people are using topical minoxidil. We've been using that for years. Low-dose minoxidil um, has been found to be beneficial in helping regrow hair. Well, what, what are we talking about in terms of dosing? Well, hypertension doses start at five milligrams and can go up as high as 40 milligrams a day or more. 
Low dose mono oral minoxidil for hair loss. For women, um, the recommended starting dose is 0.25 milligrams, maximum dose being 2.5 milligrams. The average dose for women is about one milligram a day. Men, the dose is a little bit higher. Men are bigger. They can tolerate it with fewer side effects. So what are the side effects? In doses over my, five milligrams a day, you're more likely to have side effects such as insomnia, edema or swelling, facial hair, which is hypertrichosis, tachycardia, palpitations, some headaches. Um, severe side effects have been reported, but are rare, but, but they have been reported. So, um, you know, we need to screen carefully who we give oral minoxidil to. There's no question that the dosing um, that circulates in your bloodstream, taking it orally, is higher than doing it topically. So does it work better? Well, this lovely doctor, Dr. Pancha Pratip, is um, a dermatologist from Thailand. She does an incredible amount of research on women, uh, female hair loss. Um, she's lovely. She's brilliant. And she did a recent study, which I couldn't find. She presented at the conference a couple of weeks ago. I couldn't find it published, but her study compared oral minoxidil 1.25 milligrams versus uh, minoxidil 5% milligram, 5 topical. And what her study showed was that oral was equally effective, but she didn't find it was significantly better than the topical. She did find that combination therapy of minoxidil with laser therapy did work better which we know, again, combination therapy works better. Um, this is sort of a review study by Dr. Randolph and Dr. Tosti, who are both well-known dermatologists in the United States. They reviewed um, the benefits, risks, benefits of oral minoxidil. And their final conclusion was that oral minoxidil was found to be an effective and well-tolerated alternative for healthy patients having difficulty with topical formulations. Still debatable whether oral works better than topical, but many women prefer not to put anything on their hair. And if by utilizing oral, it adds to their treatment, then I think it's a good thing. Um, hair minoxidil can treat virtually almost any type of um, hair, hair loss. Androgenic alopecia, alopecia areata, scarring alopecia, chronic telogen effluvium, uh, a lot of uh, dermatologists are using oral minoxidil to treat it. We've, we're also beginning to utilize it. Post-chemotherapy alopecia. All of these things can benefit by minoxidil, whether it's oral or topical. Another medication, spironolactone, we've talked about before. I just want to add a little bit of information to. As many of you know, spironolactone is a diuretic traditionally used for hypertension. Um, it does help androgenic alopecia. It's a known blocker of androgens or testosterone, decreases the DHT, which does damage the hair follicle and shrinks it. Spironolactone increases the conversion of testosterone to estradiol, which makes hair help, happy, at least in women. Um, it's particularly effective in young women who, who have a tendency to have normal um, Test, higher, higher levels of testosterone normally anyway. The dosage starting at 50 to 100 milligrams and increased to 200 milligrams as, as tolerated. The risks, it's safe to use right up until a woman gets pregnant, which is important because a lot of young women who have hair issues um, are afraid to come off their medications while they're getting pregnant, but you can take spironolactone right up into the moment of, of getting pregnant. It's, you have to be cautious in older women, particularly if their blood pressure runs low, because spironolactone in those types of doses where to make it beneficial can cause blood pressure falls, can also um, cause your potassium levels and sodium levels to become abnormal. Recent, this is a big important piece that recently came out, is that recent studies showed that it does not increase the risk of breast, breast cancer or increase the risk of recurrence, which is really important because if you remember on the previous slide, I said it does increase the conversion of testosterone to estradiol. Estradiol can stimulate breast cancer. So the concern was for a lot of people that women who had had breast cancer or might be at slightly increased risk of it due to family history, is spironolactone safe? And the answer is yes. And I've conferred with several oncologists in the area and they agree. I personally don't prescribe it in women past menopause for two reasons. Um, primarily the testosterone levels are already decreasing at that point, but also there is a risk of side effects of high dose diuretics. Um, in a medical practice, like I was in before, as a diuretic, when we use spironolactone, the highest dose we ever went to was 25 to 50 milligrams. To go to 100 or 200 milligrams would be not considered um, all that safe for older women. Um, quick update again on finasteride and dutasteride as well. 
Um, finasteride and dutasteride are DHT blockers. It's been used for quite a long time with men, um, mostly for men with androgenic alopecia, the doses being a, a milligram of finasteride or 0.5 milligrams of dutasteride. In women, there is some interest in using it for androgenic alopecia as well as scarring alopecia. The doses in women have to be higher, and there's really no good explanation for this. Um, there's actually no good explanation as to why it seems to help scarring alopecia because scarring alopecia does not seem to be hormonally based, but dutasteride in particular seems to help. But it, you do require higher doses than what the men use, which is interesting. Finasteride can be used orally or topically. Um, the topical um, um, formulations um, have fewer side effects associated with them as do most things topically. Again, the question of breast cancer, these are DHT blockers, they're testosterone blockers. There is some concern regarding the increased risk of breast cancer because estrogen levels can increase with these medications. And it has been known to cause breast tenderness and gynecomastia in men and in women. Two large studies showed no connection between finasteride and breast cancer in men, but sadly, uh, it still may be a concern for women. So we do not use it in, in women with a personal or family history of breast cancer or anybody with the breast cancer gene. Other risk factors, these have recently come out. There may be an increased risk of fatty liver, type two diabetes and insulin resistance. So again, in certain individuals where this may be a problem, particularly diabetics, this might not be a good choice for them. And again, pregnant women cannot even touch these pills because absorbing through the skin of this particular hormone blocker can lead to fetal abnormalities. So it has some, bent, some usefulness, but it's limited. Okay, a new thing, low dose naltrexone. Um, many of you have probably never heard of this. Some of you may have. Naltrexone is actually quite a, a, an older drug that was approved by the FDA in the 1980s. It was clinically used to treat alcohol and opioid addictions in doses anywhere from 50 to 100 milligrams a day. And it works um, under those circumstances with very few side effects. Now, what's been going on in the last five to 10 years is that low dose naltrexone has been found to help decrease inflammation and is being used to treat chronic pain. Um, it's been used in syndromes like fibromyalgia as well as unresolved pain syndromes. Um, they're, they're looking to see if there's any benefit for um, neuralgia pain, which is something that's very difficult to treat. And again, even more recently, it's been found to have anti-inflammatory benefits. The doses are very low, um, 1.5 to 4.5 milligrams daily, which as you can see is significantly less than what was used prior. The side effects are usually very mild. Um, GI upset, a little bit of diarrhea, headache, fatigue, again, generally doesn't um, cause patients to stop using it. For the past two years, we, as well as other hair loss specialists, have been using and trying to use low-dose naltrexone to treat scarring alopecia. And the reasons for this is that these entities, these scarring alopecias, the frontal fibrosing, the lichen plantar polaris, the central centrifugal cicatricial alopecias, these are very difficult to treat. We don't really know what causes them. We know that they are autoimmune disorders. They can be very aggressive and cause permanent destruction of the hair follicle. So we want to treat with whatever we can. And unfortunately, treatment is oftentimes not satisfactory. We might be able to slow the disease down a little bit, but cures are very difficult to, to, to get. So there's been some interest in utilizing the low-dose naltrexone. There um, are several physicians in New York. We've been using it. A few others in the area are considering using it as well. The scary part is that the incidence of scarring alopecia is increasing. We don't know why. As I mentioned earlier, there is some concern that um, COVID might be increasing the risk of it as well. Uh, stress may be playing a role, but there's much more likelihood due to um, um, chemicals that people are exposed to, um, whether it's uh, fragrances. Um, there's a question whether there are um, sunscreens might be playing a role, preservatives. Um, there's some ongoing research being done there actually in Boston. Um, uh, there's a physician who's now at the Leahy who is doing research on whether these chemicals might be playing a role, although it's probably not the whole role. Um, we do know that uh, genetics may play a role. There may be other factors. There was a recent study published in June, which talked about the reversible hair loss in lichen plantar polaris, the scarring alopecia, utilizing low-dose naltrexone and PRP. This woman who had, had biopsy-proven um, 
like in plantar pilaris, failed standard therapy, which is not uncommon with these scarring alopecias. They are very difficult to treat. She'd been put on finasteride, topical minoxidil, special shampoo, steroid injections, other medications. Her disease was progressing despite aggressive treatment. Um, her dermatologist had heard about low-dose naltrexone, um, had been doing PRP treatments and thought, I'm going to give this a try. And um, this woman that he reported this study, um, after th her third treatment, she did three treatments once a month for three months, continued on the low-dose naltrexone. And after three months, her hair counts were increasing, her shedding was decreasing, and the trichoscopy, which is the microscopic view of the scalp, showed that the inflammation and the scarring was going away. This is remarkable and um, very hopeful. Um, but early on, um, we've had good luck here. Um, and um, But again, uh, this is uh, something new. Um, I want to talk a little bit about scarring alopecia, uh, just a little bit more. Um, this uh, doctor I met at this conference, Dr. Ose Tutu in Brooklyn, New York. She's a derm dermatologist who specializes in a type of scarring alopecia called CCCA, which is the central centrifugal cicatricial alopecia, which is very common in African-American women. She stood up and said, basically, she's spending a lot of her time treating her own family. She's of African descent. Um, this type of scarring alopecia occurs in 16% of African-American women. There may be a gene mutation that's associated with it. Again, we don't know all the reasons why people get these diseases. Chemicals, perms, straighteners, all these things may be playing a role. She believes that COVID is aggravating it. She also believes low vitamin D plays a role here. And she also believes strongly that the stress we've all been under in the last two years is playing a role as to why we're seeing so much of it lately. She does do all the typical treatments, minoxidil, finasteride, nutraceuticals, supplements, all of that. She also does do PRP. She hasn't yet tried low-dose naltrexone, although it's on her radar. She's beginning to consider utilizing it. Unlike a lot of other people, she does hair transplants on these women. A lot of people are afraid, the surgeons are afraid to do transplants on these women because of the activity of the disease. She finds that if she treats them along with doing the hair transplant, they do pretty well. Other treatments for scarring alopecias, I've got them listed here. Um, oral medications, doxycycline, hydroxychloroquine, low-level laser therapy, very important for anti-inflammatory benefit. Again, monoxidil, topical or oral, steroids, and supplements. This is a big one. Um, first ever FDA-approved oral treatment for alopecia areata. This is like huge. There's been a lot of research going on about these medications, which are called JAK inhibitors. This one in particular, baricitinib or Alumiant, which is the brand name, um, they just published um, this, 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 the, um, the last stage of the study um, was published last spring. And it's an oral medication. They've tried two different doses, two versus four milligrams. The four milligrams seemed to work better, but it did have a few more side effects. But this is huge because alopecia areata treatment, much like scarring alopecias, the treatment is not great. You can sometimes get people in remission. It seems like the disease has a, has a, a mind of its own, very difficult to treat. These medications are also being looked at in, in terms of treatment for scarring alopecias, which is another interesting side. So this particular medication, the baricitinib, um, it, after 36 weeks, 35% of people had significant improvement. You might say, well, that's not so great. It actually is fabulous because again, treatment for, for alopecia areata is very poor in the sense that it's aggressive treatment, but it doesn't seem to work very well. And these patients that were in this study had profound loss. Most of them had greater than 50% loss of their scalp hair. Unfortunately, 59% of the patients did have side effects, but only 2% of the side effects were considered serious enough to stop the medication. I did list the side effects there. But this is this is a huge uh, deal. There are a variety of JAK inhibitors being researched for alopecia areata, so there will probably be others coming. But again, these are also looked at in terms of treating scarring alopecias, eczema, vitiligo, sarcoidosis, other skin um, diseases. So it's an exciting um, development. Um, it will be life-changing for um, thousands of people. Um, this disease, alopecia areata, um, it affects, as does scarring, uh, both of them. You know, it affects people so deeply emotionally, all hair loss does. 
Um, but I think our success rate for treating androgenic is certainly far better than the success rate for treating alopecia areata and scarring alopecia. So we treat it aggressively. We jump in early. We try to get people in remission, but it's hard. And so these new medications are a big development and um, can be life-changing. So it's very exciting. Okay, I just want to update low-level laser therapy a little bit. Um, again, at this conference that I went to a couple of weeks ago, a Dr. Juanita Anders, um, she is an expert in photobiomodulation, which is the fancy term for low-level laser therapy or all kinds of laser therapy. And her research, she actually works for the government. She works for uh, Uniform Services University of the Health Sciences in Bethesda, Maryland. Um, there's actually a medical school that the, that, um, the um, Uniform Services the government runs for their for, um, for for people in the armed services who are becoming physicians. So she her research helps explain why this works. How does this work? You know, for the longest time, people thought this was a gimmick, but in fact, it really works. And her research um, was it was she's a great speaker, and it was great to hear her uh, confirm what we already knew. As she stated, the light is absorbed by chromophones, which are actually little things inside of cells, which create changes within the cell. They create energy changes within the cell. And so it increases the oxygenation within the cell. Um, I love this model. It reminds me of something I made with my kids when they were in middle school. It hasn't changed much, but those little round oval squiggly things, those are mitochondria. That's where the energy is. And that's what the, that's where the laser therapy does its job. It increases the activity in, in those mitochondria, in the mitochondria, in the dermal papilla, which is where the hair is being made. Interestingly enough, and I didn't know this, the mitochondria activity in, in patients who have androgenic alopecia is actually decreased in the dermal papilla. So as people have developed androgenic alopecia, the energy level within the hair follicle goes down and the low level laser therapy increases it. It prolongs the antigen, which is that growth phase I talked to you about. It actually helps the hair move quickly out of the telogen phase back into the growth phase. So you don't have that resting phase that I talked about, which can last anywhere from one to four months. You can, it, so it, it stimulates hair to keep growing faster for longer periods of time. It increases the hair strength. It decreases inflammation, which is so important in those inflammatory hair losses. The ones I mentioned, like scarring alopecia, seborrheic dermatitis, all of those things, psoriasis, all of these things that are inflammation that can cause hair loss. It accelerates wound healing. Laser therapy stimulates growth factor gene expression. And so growth factors are the things that stimulate the hair to grow. And what the low level laser does is it stimulates the DNA to express those genes and to create more growth factors. It also increases the blood flow to the follicle by up to 200%, which is huge. Initially, when these, these laser devices came out, everybody thought, well, it just increases blood flow. There's so much more to it than that. As well as that's similar to minoxidil. Everybody thought, oh, it just opens up the blood vessel because it is a vasodilator. But there's so much more going on with minoxidil than just opening up the blood vessels. Same is true of low-level laser therapy. So I was excited to hear her her. Um, discussion because this is what her research is is on, and this is this is this just confirmed what we know that it does multiple things at multiple levels and should be included almost with anybody experiencing any kind of hair loss. Okay, um, supplements. This is a hot topic. <laughs> Do they really help with hair loss? Um, I will tell you that even in my own previous experience, twenty years ago, I would have probably not had a lot of interest in supplements. But as I mentioned earlier in my research uh, on supplementation and the benefits of it, our nutrition in this country, actually in the world, is, is dismal. Even if we're eating what we think is good quality food, the nutritional value has been measured yearly for the last 50 years. And vitamin levels and protein levels and nutrient levels in fruits and vegetables that are grown even organically and without pesticides, the nutritional values are decreasing. So that, you know, the nutrition you got from an apple 50 years ago is not the same. What we're getting now is significantly less. Doesn't matter what it looks like, but the nutritional value is less. And how do we combat that? 
Um, yes, we need to eat less processed foods. That's so important. Processed foods are incredibly inflammatory and can aggravate all of these types of hair loss. But how do we get those nutrients back that we need? In this part of the country, actually in, in, a, in a lot, most of the world, we're deficient in vitamin D. Um, it's, and if you live in the Northern tiers as we do, the vitamin D levels, pretty much everybody's are low. So the only way to get that is to supplement. You can, uh, we don't get enough sunlight. Um, and so there's more and more research suggesting that vitamin D is very important in inflammation, decreasing inflammation. So the supplements, do they really help with hair loss? And the answer is yes. We did our own study. And part of this is um, was born out of some skepticism because again, I, I I was always under the impression that if you ate a good diet and you stayed away from you know a, a lot of processed high fat foods that you would you know get all the nutrients and everything that you needed. But in fact, um, that's not the case. So we have we utilized our own supplements. We have um, we did a preliminary study demonstrating that utilizing an oral supplement in women who were diagnosed with andro androgenic alopecia, that they had increased density after four months. So let me tell you about our study. There's three parts to these supplements. Um, I'm gonna go from right to left. The revitalizer is a B vitamin sup uh, complex with biotin. Most of you have heard about biotin. Um, the, this, the Tress Fortifier has the DHT blocker, uh, saw palmetto, and a whole lot of other um, supplements which um, help support hair and have anti-inflammatory benefits and, um, and promote hair growth. The Tress Prebiotic Powder, I know a lot of us heard of probiotics. Probiotics are the bacteria that live in our gut. And there's more and more research being done on the fact that there's a connection between our gut health and pretty much health throughout our entire body. Um, prebiotics are, are nutrients which actually help the bacteria work better. It's a gut health dietary supplement. It's anti-inflammatory. It um, has nutrients in it that um, provide vitamins, proteins. The list is quite long. We would be happy to share those with you if you were interested. So these are the nutrients, these are the supplements that we used for this study. The requirements for the study, we actually invited quite a few women to come in. We opened it up, had invited women to come in who were interested in being part of our study. The requirements were that they had to have androgenic alopecia. So they came in and were examined. Um, we did trichoscopy, which again is that magnification of the scalp. Photos were taken of the scalp and also of the hair before and before starting the study. And all the participants had to have no treatment for six months prior to starting the study. We ended up with well, 10 uh, women, um, one fell out, but we actually had more women coming in, but a lot of them had other things than androgenic alopecia that we actually ended up taking care of them for. So it was interesting um, that a lot of these women had other things going on in terms of hair loss and and, and we're not aware. And some of these women had pretty advanced hair loss and had not sought treatment for it in the past. So for the four months during the study, they didn't use any other treatment for their hair loss other than these supplements. And so it was very interesting. We saw them um, throughout the study, but after the four months and some of them five months, these are some of the results. And I will tell you that the total change in the, in the total number of hairs on average was 15% increase of hair counts um, after four months of supplementation alone. They didn't use anything else. Um, the number of hair follicular units, meaning you know, the number of follicles that are grouped together also increased. This woman on the right with the white, white hair, I wish her pictures could, could um, project better, but she had very thin hair to start off with. But if you look above her ear, you can see how much thicker her hair is coming down from her temple to her ear. Um, she had a profound benefit. And I, I really wonder what her nutritional situation was because to have this much growth in, in just a four month period was very impressive. 
Again, subtle changes, but again, the average increase in total hairs was almost 15%. So this is a big topic. And some people would argue that it's controversial. Um, I would tell you that I don't think it's so controversial any longer. The conference that I went to, which was all hair care specialists, some of them are surgeons, some of them were um, medical professionals like myself. Um, there's still some people that are, you know, not as convinced. Um, we did share the results of our study, which was just a preliminary study. I will be the first to say it's just a preliminary study. But we were so impressed with what we saw in such a short period of time that we felt we needed to share it. Um, I don't think nutrition is the whole answer for hair loss, but I do think for right now, it can't be ignored. And any woman who's experiencing hair loss from any particular cause um, should consider nutritional supplementation. Again, the nutritional values of our food in this country is not what it used to be. We have more choices, but the value of the quality of our food is significantly less. We actually did two other webinars on nutrition and I've listed them there. Um, I welcome you, they're on our website. If you're looking for a bit more specific information about specific vitamins, um, specific nutrients, um, we go into greater detail as to what's actually in the supplements. We would be happy to share what's, uh, what the, um, what's in the nutrients. Um, but again, they, they are on this webinar and we'd be happy to share any information that you would like. So that's, that's, um, oh, I did want to say, um, I, there was other information that I could not include in this just because of time. There's a whole topic of regenerative therapy and regenerative medicine out there, meaning, you know, getting cells to grow better, making them younger, making them healthier. Um, that's a bit like what the exosome treatments were. Um, it's, it's blossoming, it's out there, there's a lot of research being done, but there really isn't anything available now. But the good news is the research is being done. I listened to one lecture a few weeks ago where um, one scientist who does all this research in hair, is really, he just loves researching hair. He believes that androgenic alopecia is an accelerated form of aging. He believes, and he did a study, he was able to predict when a woman was going to go into menopause based on when she thought her hair started to thin. So, you know, the, the incidence of hair thinning with aging, hair thinning being androgenic alopecia, the incidence is so high that he, in his study, the majority of the women could predict, um, he, could, he could predict when, when, their, when their periods were going to end based on when they started to notice their hair thinning, which was an interesting study. But he's doing a lot of research on regenerative medicine. The other thing I want to mention is the other thing he mentioned is when he, as women age, the microbiome, which means the type of bacteria and, and fungal bacteria, bacteria and fungus that grow on our scalp, normally it changes as we age. The amount of oils that we make, the sebum change, the biochemistry of our scalp changes as we age. And he's doing all the research and trying to figure out, can we reproduce the environment the way it used to be? But he also said that he felt that um, using probiotics, prebiotics, nutraceuticals, all of these things makes a difference in terms of getting that microbiome back to where it was. His research is preliminary. I'll be interested to see what he says next year because he shows up every year. But um, just those are topics that I would love to talk about at some point, uh, sometime in the near future, maybe next year if, if we have a little bit more information. Um, but again, um, interesting topics for the future. So I am 